Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Archangel Michael, defend us in battle, that we may not perish in the dreadful judgment. In the Summa Theologiae, great magnum opus of Thomas Aquinas, in the second part covering the virtues, the great doctor of the church often asks whether this or that particular virtue under discussion is the greatest of the virtues, whether it be humility, magnanimity, patience, or charity, or some other virtue. If memory serves, unless I'm mistaken, he usually answers yes, it is the greatest in some certain way. That is, when viewed under some special aspect. The same might apply to the saints. The imitation of Christ warns the pious soul not to get hung up on what saint is the greatest. Which is the greater than another? Thus we hear in the imitation, many inquire who is the greater in the kingdom of God who themselves know not whether they shall be worthy to be numbered among the saints. Yet we do know for certain the greatest of the saints is Our Lady. Pope Pius IX has a wonderful way of expressing this in the papal document defining her immaculate conception. He said, God alone accepted. Mary is more excellent than all and by nature fair and beautiful, and more holy than the cherubim and the seraphim. To praise her all the tongues of heaven and earth do not suffice. To praise her all the tongues of heaven and earth do not suffice. Pope Pius, God alone accepted. Wow. We might then ask, apart from the greatest of the saints, which of the saints was the first of all? That is, who among the saints entered heaven first? Who led the way? Now, unless I'm mistaken, the answer is St. Michael, the archangel. And let us be sure, one of the angels did lead. One did lead the way. That is the way of God. He's not egalitarian. He always operates within a hierarchical order. Now, St. Thomas gives us an important principle that proves helpful here. What is first in any order is the cause of all that follows it. What is first in any order is the cause of all that follows it. Ever wonder why St. Michael is given the title Archangel? Because he is the first in the order. That's why. Ever wonder why St. Michael is the angel invoked in the Confitior at the Holy Mass and in Compline? Or is the angel that leads departed souls to heaven? He was the first in the order of the saints. That's why. We know from the sacred scripture, most notably the sacred history of Genesis, that God made the heavens and the earth on the first day. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And God said, be light made, and light was made. And God saw the light, that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. Words taken from Genesis, first verses of the Bible. Again, God always works on many levels. At the highest level, this means on the first day, God made the heaven of heavens above, and which is the third heaven, the Empyrean heaven where the angels and the saints will take their rest. That's what he means when his Bible says he made the heaven and the earth. The highest level, heaven above. The highest heaven. This also means he created hell in the center of the earth on the first day. As for the light he made on the first day, on the highest level... This light is none other than the pure, intellectual, rational, sublime creatures that we call angels. They were made on the first day. They were created in the heavens. 
but not the Empyrean heaven, because they had to be tested first. They had to merit that grace. They were created in a state of grace, not in a state of glory. What is more, the theologians teach us the angels differ according to their powers, with Lucifer being the greatest among them. These bright, light-filled intelligences we call angels were then shown whence came their grace. They were shown something of Jesus and Mary, possibly even Calvary. Just as the Mass opens the door to Calvary for us, think of Abraham also about to sacrifice Isaac and the angel halting him and holding back his arm. He passed the test, and he saw the day of the Lord. What day did he see? Calvary. That his son was spared a sacrifice, and a lamb was killed in his place. Well, they were shown this because that was precisely how they too were going to be, or going to receive the gift of glory. To put it another way, In order to get to heaven, the angels were tested to see if they would make sacrifice, thus Calvary. What did they have to give up? Their very own selves and all that it meant to be themselves. In a word, they had to sacrifice their excellence. They had to turn from themselves toward God. They had to convert. God made them to love him And love in God's creation requires sacrifice. The good angels made the sacrifice. The bad ones did not and became devils. The demons failed the test not because they had the wrong end in mind. They wanted to go to heaven. Make no mistake about it. They knew God and they wanted to take their place before him. But they wanted to do this their way using their power without sacrificing anything of themselves. Instead, they fell into the pit at the center of the earth while the angels rose to the third heaven, the Empyrean heaven. And thus we read in that sacred history of Genesis, he divided the light from the darkness on the first day. Who led the good angels in the battle? St. Michael. In the book of the Apocalypse, we hear these ominous words. And there was a great battle in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon fought with his angels. And they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Is there not here a hint, nay, even more than a hint, that St. Michael led them in battle He also led them into heaven to take their place. He was the first in the order. Although not the greatest of the angels by nature, Lucifer was. He nevertheless sacrificed himself so perfectly, more perfectly than all the other angels. And so St. Michael became a participant in all the saintly and angelic causes that follow. This surely touches upon why he is called the archangel and seems to be the archangel of all archangels like Gabriel and Raphael and the remaining ones. A sign of this is how Gabriel could only come to the prophet Daniel after he received assistance from St. Michael, overcoming the devil blocking the way. Now, in a reverse way, the via negativa. Lucifer, as the first to rebel, becomes the cause of all the evil that follows. In this way, we can safely attribute all diabolical works to him. So all the saintly, angelic causes we can attribute to the first in the order. All the evil, diabolical causes we can attribute to the first in the order. Thus, in the end, it's Michael against Lucifer. 
and everything that happens is attributed to them as the generals. Notice, however, that our human nature, most notably in Jesus and Mary, was at the center of the conflict. And so it remains so today, and unto the end even. The devil works to destroy human souls, while St. Michael is the one who leads them to heaven, victorious in the great battle. Thus St. John states, Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. The battle centers around our human nature, and it is found on earth in a form that can still be conquered, namely our own redeemed but unsaved nature, or even unredeemed Those fighting to be like the God-man, His Majesty Jesus Christ and His holy and pure virginal mother belong to the church, and she is embattled. Thus, we belong to the church militant that makes us soldiers of Christ. We belong to an army whose captain is St. Michael, the first saint. Today, with the church under serious attack, the opposing army of fallen angels and men can be intimidating. St. John tells us when the dragon fell, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. The fathers tell us this means about a third of the angels followed him to attack the church militant. How big is this army of fiends? Blessed Francis Palau, 19th century Carmelite mystic, taught that the number of angels is beyond our reckoning. Here are his words. God has created intellects which are purely spiritual, much more sublime than man. These are the angels whose number exceed the grains of the sand in the seashores to the stars of heaven and the leaves of the trees and of grasses that have existed, exist, and will exist on earth. Francis Palau, incomprehensible. Now keep in mind that each angel is a species in itself, each reflecting some unique splendor of God, making the spiritual world much richer in variety than the material world. Notice Palau had to stretch far and wide of the material world to gather in enough even to possibly count the angels. But how can we poor limited and fallen human beings fight so many demons? The good angels have to help us. It is the duty of the heavenly angelic armies to counter the wicked infernal demons. We are not alone. The demons cannot win against a far superior force, the two-thirds of the angels, that is armed with the light and grace of heaven. Therefore, we must have confidence that these good angels will indeed be victorious in the struggle taking place in our very midst. If we cooperate with them, we too will be victorious. As St. John shows in the Apocalypse, the church will be forever triumphant, especially aided by angels led by St. Michael. Now, to build up our confidence, let us consider a few historical cases We have one right in the Bible, sacred scriptures, the book of Joshua. When Joshua was in the field, we read, in the field of the city of Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and saw a man standing over against him, holding a drawn sword. And he went to him and said, Art thou one of ours or of our adversaries? And he answered, I am prince of the host of the Lord, and now I am come. Joshua fell on his face to the ground, and worshiping said, What saith my Lord to his servant? Loose, he says, thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did as he was commanded him. This mysterious man was Saint Michael. After the great Joshua willingly purified himself, symbolized by the removal of the sandals, he made sure they were victorious against superior forces. You want to be victorious with St. Michael? 
We must do what Joshua did. Sacrifice our excellence. The more perfectly we sacrifice it, take off those sandals, the more quickly will the victory be ours and we will become successful soldiers in the divine army. St. Michael was the first to appear to the young Joan of Arc, beginning in her 13th year. He told Joan that St. Catherine and St. Margaret would soon follow. Her descriptions of St. Catherine and St. Margaret were of gentle comforters, whereas St. Michael was brilliant and bold and stern. St. Joan says of their relationship, Above all, St. Michael told me that I must be a good child and that God would help me. He taught me to behave rightly and to go to church often. It seems clear from the record that he was the one who taught her the faith so perfectly that she could stand up against a court of stern prelates and theologians because they were nowhere near the sternness and brilliance of St. Michael. And she bested them every time, even unto the end. So is the effect of being guided by the first of the angels. His causality reached into her life. Be sure to pray to St. Michael at the beginning of every good work and every day if you want the same effects. At Fatima in Portugal, the children had three main encounters with an angel, naming himself the Angel of Peace, the Angel of Portugal. It seems this great angel was none other than St. Michael, the Archangel, because Portugal has a long history of naming this leader of God's army as his patron and protector, starting with the first king of Portugal, Afonso Henriques. He died in 1185. He dedicated the chapel of the royal palace to St. Michael, and in 1514, Pope Leo X granted Portugal a special feast day in honor of St. Michael, calling him the guardian angel of Portugal. Sister Lucia describes him as a young man, about 14 or 15 years old, whiter than snow, transparent as crystal when the sun shines through it, and of great beauty. He taught them profound and important prayers such as, My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love thee. I ask pardon for all those who do not believe in thee, and do not adore thee, do not hope in thee, and do not love thee. He had them pray this three times while kneeling down and with head touching the ground. He showed them how to do this. He himself bowed down. Rising, he said, pray thus. The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. And all this he taught them reverence. Because St. Paul says Jesus was heard because of his reverence. St. Michael wants us to pray and be reverent. See how the great first saint tries to get us to do what he did. First of all and best of all. St. Michael would repeat these efforts at another visit, saying, Pray, pray very much. The hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy on you. Offer prayers and sacrifices constantly to the Most High. Offer up everything within your power as a sacrifice to the Lord in an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners. Thus invoke peace upon your country. Above all, accept and bear with submission the sufferings that the Lord may send you. St. Michael wants us to be penitent, but he wants us to be sacrificial. He wants us to sacrifice our excellence, as he did. If we want to follow him into heaven. The children were filled with awe at his presence and could not even talk about it until the next day. Not only did he build up their memories, but also made them mature very quickly, just like Joan of Arc. With his help, they had grown up almost overnight. St. John of the Cross explains how this is possible, how the wisdom of God purges and illuminates 
both angels and men, but also passes from God to men through the angels. When it is given to men, especially through such a powerful angel as St. Michael, it is received in a very limited and painful way, but also fills them with love. He says that this purgation dries the wood of the soul to prepare it for the fire of love that is to come. We can think of it like a pressure treatment of wood that squeezes out the moisture of immaturity. As a result, not only were they more prepared to withstand the extreme temperatures of the world and persecutions and the conditions in which they were in, in Fatima, Portugal, 1917, but more to the point, they were dry and ready to be set on fire with the love of God and to do and endure anything for him. St. Michael wants us to be mature to fight in his army. They were set on fire in two ways. First of all, at the third meeting of this angel, he brought them Holy Communion. He did not bring our Lord to them the first time, but slowly prepared them over some months. The sandals had to come off. And when he came the third time, he once again had them bow down and recite a beautiful prayer three times. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly, and I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of the same Son, Jesus Christ, present in the tabernacles of the world in reparation for all the sacrileges, outrages, and indifferences by which he himself is offended. And by the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and through the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of thee the conversion of poor sinners. Then, giving them Holy Communion, first time for two of the younger ones, he said, take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. When Our Lady appeared a little later, the rays of light came forth from her hands and pierced their hearts and set them ablaze, such that nothing was impossible for these little children. Clearly, St. Michael cares about the church militant. He is the prince and captain of her armies. He wants to do for us what he did for these generals, these soldiers of previous victories and battles, and these little children so that we will conquer in this dark time. But we must be willing to take off the sandals of our worldliness and do penance and be open to purging presence of St. Michael. As King David said in the Psalms, the angel of the Lord shall encamp around about them that fear him and shall deliver them. We're going to sing that tonight in, in Compline. A final but important example. When Blessed Francis Palau, that Carmelite mystic of the 19th century, entered into a mysterious struggle with God, he learned in order for him to gain the victory, St. Michael came to clothe him in the priestly garments, making the Carmelite mystic like unto God, enabling him to be heard And the same mystic received the most amazing vision of the attack of the demons upon the church in Rome. Perhaps not unlike what Pope Leo XIII would later witness. He actually wrote this up in a letter and gave it to Pope Pius IX. He met with an angel on Fort San Angelo. That is the home of St. Michael in Rome. That's where St. Gregory the Great saw him sheathe his sword after the plague had ended. In this vision involving him, we learn some very important things, and here are a few of them. Even the angels have to work in accord with the mystical body of Christ, of which they are members. In other words, they work with the hierarchy of the church on earth for the sake of the church militant and not apart from it. That's a very interesting point. They, too, have to work with the leaders of the church. Wow. 
At least that seems to be a strong message being conveyed in this letter, in this vision. This letter he gave to Pope Pius. One line is particularly remarkable where Blessed Francis Palau states like a new St. Paul and a Moses of old. Either wipe from my brow the name of God which I have invoked. And with the God's name wipe off my soul the priestly character. Or do not allow God's authority in the prelates to be abused by the demons. What a generous spirit animated this man. He also seems to be saying that if the good angels are not engaged with the prelates to use God's power for the good, the demons will be there to aid them in abusing it for the bad. Can it be that the power of the Pope to bind and lose heaven can extend even to angelic aid? Palau's vision says yes. It has an angel with a chain to heaven's authority, and he's not using it, it says. And he has a chain sitting there ready to shackle all the demons and he's not using it because the pope's not doing it yet interesting another lesson we learn a few more little lessons the infernal powers cannot do any more than what is allowed by god quote in his plans for the church in quote we know that third of all Palau points out that the political powers of the world are under the sway of the infernal power the political powers, all the states, all the governments, and that they will reach a point where they will control the Vatican and its policies. It has come true. Is the Vatican just another member of the United Nations organization? It seems to be. We're living through what Palau saw. And finally, in the vision, Palau prostrates himself before the church. She tells him, to go out and fulfill his duties of his state in life. And that is what we're all called to do in this time of great trial. That is the very penance required of our Lord and his Holy Mother. Even the great St. Michael has to do this too and wait until the mysterious plan of God moves the hierarchy to act such that the first saint can fulfill a prophecy he gave to Palau. With the tip of my sword, I will cut off the crowned heads and armed horns of the dragon in one day. The tide is going to turn. St. Michael, enlighten and purify us from the moisture of immaturity. Help us to make reparation, reverently receive the sacraments, and offer everything as a sacrifice. Give honor to those that are above us to which honor is due and respect the order established by God in his church. Fulfill our duties of state so that we will burn with pure love for God, that the hearts of Jesus and Mary will be attentive to us, that their designs of mercy will include us, will include our families, our country, and we will remain ever victorious with our Holy Mother, the church. Holy Archangel Michael, defend us in the battle that we may not perish in the dreadful judgment. Holy Archangel Michael, first of all the saints, lead our souls to heaven when our time comes to leave behind this great tribulation. And may we be always numbered in your company. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.